today we're continuing our series that we started last week. We started a series called Family Life, and we're, we're talking about issues about family and God's plan for the family. It's going to go all the way through Father's Day. And so today, our message is called A Quiver Full of Kids. Uh, you know, today, as we all know, it's a very, very special day. Today is the day that we, as a society, as a nation, we have set aside to recognize the immense value of a mother. And moms, we, we want you to make feel special today. We hope that you already have uh, uh, but we know this, being a mother is just not a walk in the park. Can I get an amen? Yeah. There was a, a study that was done, and, and they came to the conclusion that by the time a child reaches 18 years of age, a mother has had to handle some extra 18,000 hours of child-generated work. All the moms, are you feeling tired now? Uh, in fact, women who never have children enjoy the study said the equivalent of an extra three months a year in leisure time. And, uh, you know, the truth is fathers and mothers both uh, have, the, have the greatest impact on the lives of the children, greater than anybody else. And I think being a mom or a dad is, is, is one of the most challenging, most frightening, most difficult, nerve-wracking, thankless jobs in the entire world. And yet at the same time, there, there are a few things in life that are as fulfilling as being a parent. One side of parenting that is often overlooked is that as a follower of Jesus, being a parent is part of fulfilling the mission of God on this earth. See, a mom or a dad's first mission field is their own children. And God has given us these wonderful, amazing gifts, and it's our responsibility to lead them to Jesus. Not just to give them information about Jesus, not just to tell them about him, but to help them to discover the person of Jesus, to help them Learn how to live the way of Jesus. Psalm 127 verses 3 through 5 says this. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence in this place today. And I thank you for what you've already done in this service. I thank you for every mother in this place. And I, I pray, God, that you would... Speak to every one of us, every person in this place, deep in our innermost being. I pray, God, that hearts would be encouraged, that our, that our lives would be challenged as you speak to us through your word. And we, we just simply pray, Lord, have your way in us on this day. And, and we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Irma Bombeck once wrote, For the first four or five years after I had children, I considered motherhood a temporary condition, not a calling. It was a time of my life set aside for exhaustion and long hours, and it would pass. Then one afternoon, with three kids in tow, I came out of the supermarket pushing a cart with four wheels that went in opposite directions when my toddler's son, son got away from me. Just outside the door, he ran toward a machine holding bubble gum in a glass dome. In a voice that shattered glass, he shouted, Give me, give me! I told him I'd give him what for if he didn't stop shouting and get in the car. As I physically tried to pry his body from around the bubblegum machine, he pulled the entire thing over. Glass and balls of bubblegum went all over the parking lot. We had now attracted a sizable crowd. I told him that he would never see a cartoon as long, again as long as he lived, and if he didn't, control his temper, he was going to be making license plates for the state. Well, he tried to stifle his sobs as he looked around at the, at the staring crowd, and then he did something that, was, that I was to remember for the rest of my life. In his helpless quest for comfort, he turned to the only one he trusted with his emotions with, me. He threw his arms around my knees and held on for dear life. I had humiliated him, chastised him, and berated him, but I was still all he had. That single incident defined my role. I was a major force in this child's life. She, she finishes up by writing this. Sometimes we forget how important stability is to a child. I've always told mine the easiest part of being a mother is giving birth. The hardest part is showing up for it each day. You know, Mother's Day is a day, traditionally the day when children give something back to their mothers for all the spit they produced to wash dirty faces, 
for all the old gum that they held in their hands, for all the noses they wiped, all the bloody knees that they made well with a kiss. This is the day that mothers are rewarded for washing all those sheets in the middle of the night, driving kids to school when they miss the bus and enduring all the football games in the rain. It's a, it's a, it is an appreciation day for making your children finish something that they said they couldn't do, not believing them when they said, I hate you, and sharing their good times and their bad times. Their cards probably won't reflect it, but what they're trying to say is, thank you for showing up. You know, I can't think of a time in history when it's been harder to be a, a Christian mother or a Christian parent than today. It seems that, that, that virtually everything is pitted against the family. You, you send your kids out into a world filled with dangers like drugs and alcohol and pornography and all kinds of different things out there, and you're almost afraid for them to get beyond the end of the driveway. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but can I just pause for a second? I'm getting a reflection through the window off of a windshield. I think it's Chuck's truck. If somebody might be able to move that, because I'm being blinded. <laughs> I appreciate that. The schools. The schools used to reinforce what Christian parents tried to teach in their homes, but that's not the case any longer. Now, there's certainly some great, wonderful, good Christian education, educators who are trying to reinforce family values, but... But we also know that there are many teachers that, that, uh, that, that, that undermine all that you're trying to teach as a Christian mom. And the world today is pretty much aligned against the family, and every mom wishes that she could build a wall around her children and protect them from everything going on in the world today. Isn't that right? Even in the home, you know, the, the assault on the family continues on television. Uh, shows that have always been... Uh, safe, uh, that, that, you, that, that you're supposed to think is there's no issues there. Suddenly they hear language that you don't want them to hear and they see lifestyles portrayed that you don't want them exposed to. And on, and on top of the difficulty of being a mom, society seems to be tearing down the importance of motherhood. We're told that women who choose to stay at home, which is a very difficult choice in today's economy, but, they, but, but mothers that choose to stay home with their children, they're, they're told that they're second-class citizens almost because they haven't reached their full potential in life. Listen, being a mom is a tough job, and it's often a very thankless one. So the question is, with all of this going on, how can we be successful in raising our children to be men and women who love God, who walk in holiness and walk in love? Well, the passage that we read a few moments ago says that children are like arrows in the hands of a warrior. And that there are several ways, I, I think, that it shows us um, that, that children are, are like arrows and that, that it, make it ap make application for us today. The first of these is that an arrow must be aimed. An arrow must be aimed. An arrow is useless if it's just randomly shot. The, the one shooting the arrow must take aim. Am I right, Lee? You know, if you, he likes to go bow fishing. If you just shoot randomly, you're not going to hit what you, anything at all. If it's just going to be uh, luck. Children must, it's very same with children. Children must receive direction from their parents. In fact, can I tell you this? This is something that maybe not every parent thinks about. It's something we need to be aware of, though. The truth is, every parent is aiming, is directing his or her child in one direction or another. Every parent is already giving direction to their children. And it's not enough just to say the right things or, or to send your children to church or to live halfway for Christ. Children are being aimed. They're being pointed in a certain direction by watching their, their parents. Because here's the reality. Children are taught by example. I remember the pastor I worked for for many years in Twin Falls, Idaho. He used to say children are, learn in three ways. By example, by example, and by example. It doesn't really matter what you say, they're going to follow your example. They're going to watch how you live. They're taught by example. They learn from our actions. They, they want to do what you do. They learn not only from our actions, but they learn from our attitudes. They will learn to have the attitude you exhibit around the house. And they, they tend to love the things that we love. So 
if you care about sports, then they tend to care about sports. If, if you love money, they t- tend to love money. If you love music, they tend to love music. Whatever you love, your children notice that and they tend to love those things. Why is that? Because they love you and they want to be part of your life. This is how they re- receive direction. So we need to be aware of this and, and think about it because we, we should be aiming our kids toward Jesus and not toward any other earthly goal. What, what good is it if our children are successful in life, but they don't know God? What good is it if our children are successful in making money? Maybe they become the richest person in the history of all mankind. What good is that if they lose out with God? What good is it if our children drive fine cars when they grow up and they live in upscale neighborhoods? What good is that if they don't know Jesus? What good is it if they become the greatest athlete the world has ever seen if they're walking in darkness? What does it matter if they gain the whole world and lose their own souls? You know, I have many, many hopes and dreams for my two girls and uh, I had to resist the temptation to call them little girls because they're not little anymore. But you know what I'm talking about. They're always little in your eyes as a parent. But I have a lot of hopes and dreams for them. There are a lot of things I'd love to see, see, see them accomplish. But you know what? The most important thing I pray for is not that they will grow up and be successful, not that they'll grow up and have lots of money. I'd be great if they did and supported their dad, you know. Uh, but the, what I pray for is that they will grow up to know and love Jesus. That's all that matters. Everything else is fluff. Everything else is gravy. That's all that really matters. So pray for your children. Pray pray that your children will be saved. Pray that your children will know and love Jesus. That's the place to begin. They need to know that He is the ultimate goal. But the problem is that too often they're watching our lives and we say those words, we say things like that, but they're learning from our example that money and possessions are really the ultimate goal. Too often they're learning that recreation and leisure time is the most important thing in the world. But the truth is everything on earth will fade away, but a relationship with Jesus will last forever. So how do we teach them that Jesus is the ultimate goal in life? Well, it's really very simple. Which, by the way, never mistake the word simple for easy. Because many things are simple, but that doesn't mean they're easy to do. But it's very simple. We've already, we've already touched on it. We teach our children. We teach them that Jesus Christ is the ultimate goal in life by making Him the ultimate goal in our lives. By making Him, our relationship with Him, our highest priority. When we stay away from church for our own selfish reasons, all we're doing is we're teaching our kids that our own desires are more important than obeying the Word of God. When we send our, our, our children to, to, to church instead of bringing them to church with us. I mean, this is one of my things that parents feel. I've known many parents that send their kids to church, and I'm glad they do, but they think they're doing this great thing. But what they're really doing them is they're teaching their kids that Jesus is just for kids, Church is just for kids. When you get to be an adult, you can, you can be done with all of that stuff. When we spend our lives in the pursuit of money and possessions and give little to no thought of the condition of our own souls, we teach our children that money is all you need. When we make comfort and pleasure a priority instead of moving when God says to move and giving when God says to give and doing what God says to do, we teach our children that the ultimate goal in life is not to be obedient to God, but to do whatever makes them feel good and whatever is comfortable for them. So dad, don't be surprised if your, your child doesn't listen to you when you tell them to stay away, stay away from drugs and alcohol when you left your family because you, you thought you needed another woman to make you happy and you did what you wanted for your happiness. And mom, don't be shocked when your children do their own thing in, in spite of your best advice when you have spent your time pursuing personal happiness at the expense of your family. The question is simple for us. What are you hungry for? What is it that you desire more than anything? And if you answer that question, you'll know what direction you're aiming your children. Your children will love what you love. So to have a child that will go the distance with Jesus, we need to be ready to go the extra mile today. So, number two, not only does an arrow need to be aimed, But if you're going to shoot an arrow, the bow must be drawn. 
I think I'm correct on that. I'm looking to leave my, my bow hunting expert over there. It doesn't do any good if you put an arrow on there and don't pull the string. You've got to draw the bow. An arrow will never fly if the bow is never drawn. And I'm going to use that as a parallel. Drawing the bow is a, is a parallel to preparing a child. You're getting it ready for flight. And that's what you do. Children will not go far toward the, toward the goal of following Jesus if we don't prepare them right now. Proverbs 22, 6 says, direct your children under the, onto the right path, and when they're older, they will not leave it. So how do you direct your children onto the right path? How do you prepare your child for a future with God? Well, the first thing is, as we've already talked on, live a consistently godly life. They're watching your example. You need to live for Jesus. You need to make it be real at home. And listen, it doesn't mean you can't ever make a mistake. I want to make this clear. Any parent here ever, uh, ever, uh, have you, have you never made a mistake? Yeah, there's one person that raised their hand. He's a liar. <laughs> uh, no, he's just joking. No, of course you've made a mistake. But when you make a mistake, when you sin, when you lash out in anger instead of responding in a Christ-like way to your child, what you have to do is own that and say, listen, I was wrong. I'm not perfect. I'm still growing in this, but I've asked Jesus to forgive me. Now, will you forgive me? And be real with them. But live a consistent godly life. The second way to prepare your child is to teach your children to pray. And how do you do that? You don't teach your children to pray by sending them to Sunday school. You don't teach your children to pray by just simply sending them to church somewhere. You teach your children to pray by your example of prayer. Teach them to pray. Pray with them at home. Pray with them around the altar. When they get sick at home, don't just feel them their, their forehead and say, oh, poor baby, I, I'll, I'll find you some medicine. Pray with your child. Take a moment and just say, Lord, I'm going to pray with you that Jesus will heal you. Take a moment and pray with them when they're sick. Pray about everything so that they will learn to turn to God in every part of their life. E.V. Uh, Ed Hill who pastored Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles for years. He tells a story of how mama's love and, and prayers changed his life. During the height of the Great Dep Depression, Hill's real mother, who had five children of her own, she just didn't have enough food to, to feed all of them. So she sent uh, the four-year-old Ed to, to live with a friend in a small country town called Sweet Home. That's a great town, name for a small country town, isn't it? Sweet Home. Well, Ed, this friend, he just called her Mama. And as he grew up in Sweet Home, Mama displayed remarkable faith, which led her to have big plans for Ed. Against nearly insurmountable obstacles, uh, Mama helped Ed graduate from high school. In fact, he was the only student that graduated from that, that country school that year. And, and he, she even insisted that he go to college. She, she took Ed to the bus station. She handed him the ticket, gave him $5, and said, now go off to Prairie View College, and Mama's going to be praying for you. Hill says he didn't know much about prayer, but he knew Mama did. So when he arrived at the college, with a, by that time he had $1.90 left in his pocket. And they told him that, that he needed $80 in cash in order to register. Well, here's how Hill described what happened next. He, he says, I got in line, and the devil said to get out of line. But I heard Mama saying in my ear, I'll be praying for you. So I stood in line on Mama's prayer. Soon there was only one other new student ahead of me, and I began to get nervous, but I stayed in line. Just about the time the other student got all of her stuff done and turned away, Dr. Drew came up behind me and touched me on the shoulder, and he said, Are you Ed Hill? I said, Yes. Are you Ed Hill from Sweet Home? Yes. Dr. Drew asked, Have you paid yet? Oh, no, not quite. He said, Well, we've been looking for you all morning. He said, Well, what do you want with me? And Dr. Drew said, well, we have a four-year scholarship that will pay your room and board and your tuition and give you $30 a month to spend. And I heard Mama say, I'll be praying for you. Teach your children to pray. Third thing to prepare your kids, teach your children about who God is. Listen, I want you to understand this, mom and dad both. You are the primary teachers for your children. There's no more, there's some, you're, they're going to come across some great teachers in their time in the educational system, 
but there is no teacher like mom and dad. You're the primary teachers. That's the way God has designed it. So, but, but, what, but I want to tell you this. Don't spend your time teaching your children about the kind of rules we follow as Christians. Don't spend your time teaching about the kind of rules we follow. Teach them about the kind of God we serve. Listen to me. What we tend to do is we, we take these mighty acts of God and we, we sort of boil them down to children's stories. I mean, listen, I've said this before, but whatever gave us the idea that Noah's Ark was a story for kids. Why? Because it's animals, you know? We, we mention the animals, but we leave out the part where God massacred most of humanity. You know, we don't like to talk about it. We put Noah's Ark on the wallpaper in our kids' room. How weird is that? You know, they say, what is this? What's this story about? And we're like, well, that's where God destroyed almost every human in humanity. Sleep well, you little silly. Kiss, kiss. You know, it's just a little weird to me. <laughs> We boil down these great mysteries, these thick problems, these difficult scenarios from Scripture, and we turn them into kids' stories. But listen, you don't impart the Word of God to your kid by talking to them about the animals of the ark or just telling them the story of David and Goliath. That's not imparting the Word of God to them. That's telling those stories. Now, there are stories that are in the Bible, albeit, so that's good, that's great. But the goal is to impart the sacredness of scriptures to your children. So when you tell them about David and Goliath, you have to tell them what it means. You have to say, David is, a, is, is like Jesus. And when he killed Goliath, that's when Jesus took care of all of our sins. And you, you explain it to them. You, you talk to them about who God is. So you talk with your kids about the magnificence of Jesus. Talk with your children about the power of God. Talk with your children about the holiness of God. Talk with your kids about the immeasurable grace of Jesus. Talk with your children about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Talk with your kids about the glory of God. Talk with your children about what sin is and what happens when sin is left unchecked. Talk with your children about, about what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Impart to them the Word of God, not just a few stories that don't mean anything. Tell them about who God is. And Jesus, when you tell them those stories, when you begin to impart to them the Word of God, Jesus will use those scriptures to woo your children to himself. The fourth thing, encourage your children. Encourage your children. Maybe I should add, encourage your children in Jesus. A mother's words can encourage and inspire her children, or they can discourage and deflate them. And I don't know, if, even, even probably, maybe even more so than a dad's words, I don't know of a person on earth that has the kind of power in their words that a mom does. Someone once said, mothers write on the hearts of their children what the world's rough, rough hands cannot erase. And moms, don't ever forget the tremendous impact you have on your children. By the way, I want to say this. It doesn't matter if your children are adult or not. You still, your words still have an impact on their lives. And every, every grown adult here who, who needs, who every once in a while still longs to hear words of encouragement from the mom, you know that's true. Listen to what some of these great men have said about their mothers. Pablo Picasso said, when I was a child, my mother said to me, if you become a soldier, you'll be a general. If you become a monk, you'll end up as the Pope. He said, instead, I became a painter and wound up as Picasso. George Washington said, the greatest teacher I ever had was my mother. Abraham Lincoln said, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. Your words have power. Speak words of encouragement to your children. Let your children know that you believe that God has great things in store for them. That's why I'm not just saying encourage them. You know, by the way, I'm just going to say something, probably make somebody mad, but it's happened before. You know, we, we tell our kids lies sometimes. We say things, you can be anything you want to be. Well, it's, that's, not, that's just not true. You know, if, if you're slow and can't jump, you're not going to be an NBA all-star, right? So, okay, it's not true. Here's what's true. You can be anything that God has planned for you. That's what's true. You can encourage them in the Lord in that way. You need to remind your children that they were born to be world changers for God. 
They need to hear that from your mouth to say, hey, you were not here by accident. You're not just some, some uh, surprise that happened uh, that, that nobody knew. God planned you and he's got a plan for your life and you were put on this earth to make a difference. You were born to be a world changer. You know, I remember a time in my life when I was a young man, before I was in the ministry even, but I was preparing. I was in Bible college, if I remember correctly. And, but I was really, really struggling inside. I was hurting. I, I was really down on myself. I can remember I was talking with my mom on the phone and we were, we were arguing about something, you know, some piddly little thing. And I was upset or whatever it was. But, but she, as we were talking, as we were having this conversation she abruptly changed the tone of the conversation and all of a sudden she just kind of got quieter and she said, David, what's wrong? She had sensed that what we were talking about wasn't really the issue, that there was something else going on in my life. And, and, and so I told her how at that point in my life I thought I was a nothing, that I just couldn't do anything right. I felt like a failure. And after, honestly, it was just a, it was just a, a pity party is all it was. And, and after a few seconds of my going on in my own self pity and, oh, poor me, woe is me kind of stuff, instead of rebuking me and saying, what are you doing, you idiot? You know, she didn't do that. Instead, she just said, oh, David. She, she, she kept it quiet. She said, oh, David, you have so much going for you. And she said, God is going to use you. No one, and I remember I'm being on the phone and I just start crying because I needed to hear somebody I trusted tell me that God had a plan for me. And no one will, no one will ever know the massive impact that statement had on my life. And I realized in that moment that my mom believed in me and that helped me believe that God could really use me. So speak words of encouragement into the lives of your children and those words will impact them forever. Be the voice of encouragement when, when they feel like giving up, when they say, I'm useless, I'm ugly, I'm all this, I'm that, I'm whatever it is, you look them straight in the eye and say, no, 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 listen, you are a child of God created by God. You're a world changer. Don't forget that. Don't, don't, it doesn't matter what you feel right now. You can't trust your feelings. I'm telling you the truth. You are a world changer. Take time to lead your children to Jesus with your life and with your words. Then the third thing is this, an arrow that is aimed with the bow that is drawn is no good uh, 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 if that's where you stop. The arrow must be released. The arrow will never hit the target that the shooter is aiming at unless they let, unless, if that person refuses to let the arrow go. And it's so, you can see the parallel here. And I believe this with all my heart, and I'm coming up on this stage in my life, but I'm here to tell you the hardest part of parenting is letting go of your child. We all have dreams for our children. But listen, I, I want to just rephrase that because it's not just later when they get older, but even when they're younger, while you're praying for them, you have to learn to let go of your child because we all have dreams for our children. But I want you to know God has even bigger dreams for, you, from your, for your children than you do. And your child can never fulfill the magnificent plan that God has for them until you're able to let go and let God have his way, even when they're young. You know, we desperately, desperately want to help our children avoid pain and suffering, don't we? I mean, ever been there? Have you been in that place? Where, I remember one time when, we were, uh, when Aaron was in grade school, um, maybe second, third grade, something like that. And, and uh, I was, there was some girl in line that was bigger than her and started picking on her. And, I mean, I didn't want her to suffer that. I wanted, I wanted, to, I wanted to go beat up this little girl. You know, was, I, I refrained because I suddenly realized, no, that would probably get me in jail. And I don't want to start a jail ministry, so I didn't do it. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, but we, want to, we want to keep our children from experiencing pain and suffering. But here's, here's the question. What if God's plan leads them into pain and suffering. Are we willing to let go? What if God wants to use the suffering of one of your children to carry the gospel to people who have never had an adequate pre presentation of the gospel? You know, as a little boy growing up in Portland, Oregon, Jim Elliott listened carefully as 
visiting missionaries, told about life on far, faraway mission fields, and he asked them questions and dreamed about being a missionary himself one day. And when he grew up, his dream became a reality. He went to Ecuador as a missionary to tell the people of that nation about Jesus. It was there in Ecuador that Jim Elliott and four other missionaries were brutally murdered by the Alca Indians as they tried to tell them about the love of Jesus. Well, Jim Elliott, later on, his death and his blood shed in the river is what opened the door to be able to share the gospel with the Alca Indians. They, they by their law, by their uh, traditions, they had to listen to somebody who had blood in the, uh, shed in the, in the sacred river. And so they, the door was open. But listen, I want you to hear this. Think about this. We never think about this. I guarantee you, Jim Elliott's mother would never have planned such a violent end for her son. But it was through his death that the doorway to share Jesus with the Alka Indians was open. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she would never have planned the kind of life and death for her son Jesus that, that God had planned, but it was through his suffering that the price for our sins has been paid. Paul's mother, the Apostle Paul, his mother, would never have wanted her child to go through the sufferings that he did, but it was through his sufferings that Europe received the gospel, and as a result, eventually, we then in the United States have been blessed with the gospel. Many, many great saints of God have suffered tremendously, but have been used by God to change the course of history in this world. So I just beg you, I implore you, let go of your child, entrust them to God's care, and trust them to God's plan. Just say, God, whatever you have for them, wherever you want to take them, you do it. I'm here to tell you, there, there's, there's going to be some suffering down the road for them at some point in time. That's the way of this world. We live in a broken world, and there's suffering that comes. And God may even lead your child into some suffering, but I'm here to tell you, God's glory will follow. You know, I have found over the years, I, I spent many years, almost two decades in youth ministry. And I, I can't tell you how many times that we'd go to camp and God would do some powerful work in a ch child's life and they, they would feel, sense the calling of God on their life to go into ministry. And, and, and Which, by the way, ministry is a calling, not a profession. Um, if you're not called to it, you won't last very long because it's not easy. But we'd go home from a, from a summer camp and these kids would be on top of cloud nine. They'd be so excited. They'd be just practically high on Jesus. They're so excited about what God's doing, what God wants to do. And they'd go home and they'd tell their parents, they'd say, Mom, Dad, I feel called by God to go into ministry. And, and, the, and the biggest obstacle in those kids' lives often was their parents. Their parents would say, oh, well, we'll see. I think it's, maybe it's just emotional. You know, you should have something to fall back on. No, listen, if you're called by God, you don't need anything to fall back on. And, and, and I've seen parents uh, uh, just crush these, these great spiritual dreams that their children had of pursuing a life of ministry. But I'm here to tell you, this is the highest calling that we have. It's a greater privilege to be a preacher of the gospel for me than it is for, than it would be to be the president of the United States. This is a high calling. So I'm here to tell you, just let go of your child. Let God have his way with your child. Let him do what he wants to do. And if he leads them to suffering, it's because glory will follow. So learn to let go. Parents, you have an awesome, fierce, God-given responsibility before God. Your children desperately need you. They need you to take time for them. For if, you, if, you, if you don't, you'll never have a chance to give them direction. I don't have time to tell you the story now, but I'll hear to, I'm here to tell you, if you're not there for them when they're three, they're not going to show up for you when, when you're older. Prepare your children for a lifetime of serving God and let Him have His way with your child. Mom, I'm here to tell you, you are a force to be reckoned with in the life of your children. And I also want to say this, there are many of you ladies here that you may not be a mom, but you, ha but you have a, an impact on the lives of children around you. You have the same force. You are a force to be reckoned with in the life of children. Become a mama who knows how to pray. Because your prayers are powerful. 
Your prayers know no bounds. Your prayers can reach around the world and back. Your prayers can break the chains of the enemy when your child is running from God. Your prayers can provide protection for your children that you could never provide in your own capabilities. I want to tell you about a young man named Peter Richley. Peter Richley was, we're going to close with this. Peter Richley was running from his old life in England. He was dissatisfied with his uneventful life and struck out for, for Australia. He spent many years on the seas as a sailor. And, and it was in the year of 1820 when Richley became caught up in a series of incredible circumstances. Richley found himself treading water after the ship on which he had been sailing sank. In 1820 now, sinking, uh, sailing, sinking, swimming, and being saved were not all that un- un- uncommon, but still Peter Richley's story is unique. See, the, the, the ship that rescued Richley after being shipwrecked and, and, and lost at sea, that ship also ended up going down. For a second time in his journey, Richley found himself bobbing like a cork in the ocean. Well, eventually a third ship found Richley and rescued him. And for a third time, Richley was hauled out of the drink and onto the deck of a rescue ship when that ship, by you, you might guess by now, when it sank, as did the fourth ship and the fifth ship. I'm just going to say parenthetically here, if I was on that sixth ship when we pulled him up and he told me the story, I'm throwing him back. (laughs) But it was after that fifth ship that went down that Richley found himself floating in the solitude of the sea and he came to the conclusion that God was saving him for a purpose. And sure enough, another ship called the City of Leeds, that was, was named after the city of its origin, this, the city of Leeds came by and answered his call for help, and it was a ship tra- traveling from England to Australia. Well, the crew of the city of Leeds hoisted Peter abro- aboard, and it took just a, a short time for Richley to be dried off and fed and pronounced healthy by the ship's doctor. Before Richley could settle down, though, the physician, the ship physician, asked a favor of this 19th century Jonah. He said, there's an old lady on board our ship who is headed to Australia to see her son, and She has become quite ill. She seems to be drawing near to death. And in her lucid moments, she asks to see her son. Sadly, we want to do something to make her feel better, but she knows all of us, and none of us can pretend to be her boy. Would you be willing to play the part just to give this lady some peace? Peter said, well, you saved my life. I'll do anything you ask me to do. And he followed the doctor to the woman's cabin. There on a small bed lay a frail woman with silver hair, she was obviously suffering from a very high fever and deliriously she was, she was crying out, please God, let me see my son before I die. Let me, I must see my son. The ship's doctor gently pushed the young man toward the bed. Soon, however, Peter richly began sobbing. For lying there on that bed was the reason he couldn't seem to die. Here was the lifeline that had kept him from drowning. For lying on that bed was none other than Sarah Richley, who had prayed for 10 years to reconcile with her son, Peter. The ship's doctor stood in amazement as the young man fell down by the bed and embraced the sick woman. I'm here, Mom. I'm here. It's me. Well, within days, she, the, the fever finally subsided and his mother awakened to find an answered prayer seated on the edge of her bed. Listen. Never, never, never underestimate the power of a praying mother. Would you bow your head with me? Father, I thank you for every mom in this place. And I pray, God, that you would raise up a generation of praying moms that are willing to to hit their knees and do battle for their children, who will, who will live a, a consistent godly life and their children will learn to love Jesus by the way they love Jesus. And God, I know that there are some here today that maybe there are moms who have children who are running from God. I pray, God, that you would help them in those moments where they feel discouraged and they feel like giving up and they, 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 it just seems like nothing's happening. God, I pray you would encourage their hearts and they would keep on praying because there's power in that prayer. Because as we pray, the reason there's power in that prayer is because we're praying to an all-powerful God. We will remember who we're praying to. The creator of the universe. The one who can do miracles like no other. 
That's who we're praying to. And so, God, we're going to keep praying. And I'm asking God that you would, you would bring breakthroughs into the lives of those children. For moms of young children, I pray, God, that you would help them. And, and, and Lord, really any, any age child that, that these moms would, would be able to learn to just let go and trust you with their children. And that they would say, God, whatever your plan is, you have your way. And Lord, that, that we would never as parents stand in the way of you fulfilling their plan, your plan for their life. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Actually, I don't want to do it that way. I want everybody just to look up at here at me. Here's what I want to do instead in closing. I want every mom in this place just to stand right where you are. Would you do it? Moms, I want you to hear me. You are heroes of the faith. You are warriors. And, and your prayers make a difference. And God's going to raise up your children. I don't care who they are, how old they are. I don't care what, what issues they may have had. I'm here to say I believe God's going to raise up your children as world changers. Some of you are old enough that your grandchildren. You look at them and I want you to know they're I've been told, I don't have grandkids yet, but I've been told that it's a whole new level of love with those grandbabies. Listen, don't forget your job's not done. God's going to raise up those grandbabies as world changers. And, and the very things, you know, <laughs> the very things that probably drive you crazy, that energy, that independence, those are going to be the very things that God uses to raise them up as leaders. So I want to pray for you. And, uh, and, and we just, I just want to ask God's blessing on you. I want to pray for, an encouragement, uh, for encouragement in your life. And I just want you to just know that the Lord is with you. I believe the mother's heart reflects the love of God in, in such a powerful way. And your, your love your, for your children is showing your children how much God loves them. So I challenge you, aim the, aim the arrow, pull the bow, and then let go, of the, let go of the arrow. Let it fly. Let God take them where he wants to take them. I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for all of these moms, these grandmothers. And I pray, God, that in the name of Jesus, that you would, you would just lay your hand of, of, of anointing upon them, encourage their hearts today. Let them know how loved they are. I pray, God, that this will be a special day. And God, those that are feeling discouraged for whatever reason, I pray that you would encourage them, that you would strengthen their hearts, and that today they would know that they are in the hands of God, that they are being used by God, and you're going to raise up their children and their grandchildren to do great things for the kingdom of God. And we thank you for all that you've done and all you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.